Um, let's plough on. We got to the end of looking at beats and we had a bit of a play around with a couple of speakers and signal generators, those who were here last, uh, last time, um, in order just to go over in some practical sense what we've covered. So this morning, uh, we're pretty much, I think, going to finish with sound waves and we will make a start on electromagnetic waves, at least that's my plan. Um, how far we'll get into, into uh, EM waves, I'm not sure. We'll play that by ear. But let's finish off sound waves first. Um, we've talked about standing waves before, okay, before we got into sound, uh, sound waves, but you know, they're actually quite important in the context of sound. Not only vibrations on strings uh, in the context of, of instruments and so on, um, but also in air columns. So again, you know, all the wind instruments, for instance, uh, will rely on uh, setting up um, standing waves, or resonance effects, essentially, right, all the way through to the huge organ in Canterbury Cathedral, uh, which relies on setting up standing waves. In that case, in huge cylindrical columns of air, right, the organ pipes. And that's essentially what's happening. We're getting a standing wave established in those tubes. So we'll, we'll sort of talk through that um, relatively quickly, because this is a topic we've now done once already. Excuse me. So I don't propose to spend uh, long on it. Um, just to sort of talk about it again in the context, as I say, of sound waves. Um, I've got to tell you, this feels incredibly uncomfortable not being able to walk gently up and down while I'm talking. Um, so bear with me. Um, all right, so let's tackle it slightly differently. Last time you remember, we talked about a vibration <coughs> a piece of string or wire or whatever. And we started the vibration at one end, you'll remember. It travelled all the way along to the fixed point, was reflected, and came back again. Okay, now because I want to talk about the principle of standing waves, we'll tackle this just, you know, slightly differently. So we'll talk about starting the vibration in the centre of the wire with fixed points at either end. So, you know, here's your musical instrument an analogy. <coughs> right. um, but the, exactly the same principle applies. And you remember the principle, what's the key physical principle that we're citing in all of the cases we've looked at thus far? Superposition, thank you. So all we're going to work on is the fact that we start a vibration in the middle of the string, it's now going to travel in either direction to the fixed points at either end where there will be reflection. Right? The reflective wave will travel back towards the centre again. If a wave peak comes back towards the centre as we're creating the next wave peak or the next but one wave peak, whatever the situation might be, then we're going to get, through superposition, some constructive interference going on. Uh, constructive, um, yeah, constructive interference. Right? So we'll have a bigger amplitude created, in other words. Uh, if we get a wave trough coming back at the time that we're generating a wave peak in the centre, then we will get some destructive interference. Yeah? So it's exactly the same process. Um, you know, which I've tried to spell out in words on the screen as well. And the key thing, therefore, is that all we've got to worry about is the fact that the, the time to get from the centre where we created our wave, <coughs> excuse me, out to the fixed point, back to the centre again, has got to be half a period, right, for this to work. Remember, our reflected waves get flipped upside down. So you've got to factor that in. Um, so if that's half a time period, we've immediately got our equation for you know, what the um, fundamental wavelength must be. If that's half a period, then a full fundamental wavelength has got to be twice the length of the wire. Yeah? So it's exactly the same relationships that we had last time. All I've done is start the wave in a different place. It's actually irrelevant where we start the wave. The key thing is what's the principle of superposition going to give us when we add our outgoing wave, the one we're creating, to the reflective wave <coughs> at any point along that piece of string. 
And if we get the relationship right, you know, as per the demonstration I did on the bench with the vibrating, literally vibrating bit of string, um, then we can set up a sound wave. Right? We actually get to localize the energy in, in space. So these are very similar diagrams, if not identical diagrams, to the one that I showed you before. Um, <coughs> and the relationship between our fundamental frequency um, up here, <coughs> excuse me, and the overtones is exactly the same relationship because it's exactly the same physical principle. So it's irrelevant where we start the wave, where we consider we started the wave. Um, the same physical principles are going to apply, come what may. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, then we get to the issue of setting up vibrations in air tubes. All right, so it's the it's the church organ, clarinet, saxophone, you know, whatever instrument you want to think of. Uh, it, this is the problem that we're talking about now. Okay, so what we get in, um, let's take the simplest one, or at least the simplest one to draw, uh, which is essentially the, uh, the organ pipe, all right? There it is, there's the organ pipe. So we have something down the bottom here which is creating a vibration, all right? And, and this is, you know, this is whatever the shape opening is they have at the bottom where they blow the air across and make the vibration. Right, this is blowing. Uh, I mean, you can <coughs> try this blowing across the top of beer bottles or milk bottles or whatever, right? And making a sound come out. This is precisely what's happening in this case. And all we're going to end up with um, at some level or another, gosh, let's see, can I actually manage to draw this? Is you know, a fundamental frequency setup, for instance. Or put some more colours. Ah, this one. Uh, let's see if I can get this right. Right, or we start getting overtones. Right, it's just playing different notes basically. So the reason in a uh, you know in a big church organ or a concert hall organ uh, that you have all these different sized pipes, different length pipes basically is that it becomes, you know, easier to set up standing waves um, of in one frequency range or another. Yeah. I, I guess I'm struggling to picture that with longitudinal waves like sound. Yeah, I, what I'm plotting, I suppose, is amplitude. All right, so you're absolutely right. That's a good point to raise. It, it, it is pressure waves we're talking about. All right, so we're talking about a maximum in the pressure here which is now static in space, all right? Uh, we're talking about a node in the pressure here, so a you know, minimum change to the pressure here, which is static in space. So hence, it's a, it is, you know, we're plotting pressure, I suppose, as a function of distance along there. Does that clarify it a little bit? Yeah. There is one other killer question that nobody's asked yet. Right. So far, I've talked about setting, having a source of vibration, and that gets reflected, and we superpose the two, and that's what creates our standing wave. Okay. Nobody's yet asked me where the reflection is. Where does the reflection come from? No. They're open. They're open at the top. Back from the atmosphere around? Yeah, well, it is, actually it is. It's, it is pretty much that. It's because we've got these, this pressure variation, right, to go along the tube, because it is a longitudinal sound wave, which is quite rightly so. Um, and actually, in this little region up here, there's a slight change then in pressure to the more static atmospheric pressure outside. And that is enough to cause a bit of the outgoing wave to be reflected back down again. And it is only a little bit, but it's enough, actually, to build up this standing wave underneath. So it's a fairly <coughs> interesting and fairly complex process, uh, but it does work. <coughs>
Right, so, where are we? Um, okay, I mean, don't dwell on this. This is, this is just filling in the, the missing bits, as it were. Uh, but just to make the point that standing waves uh, in, um, in acoustic science are actually really quite important. Okay, so, last bit, uh, in terms of sound, uh, is the Doppler effect. Um, and I'll extend this a little bit to, um, to talk about the Doppler effect in astronomy and so on before we finish. <coughs> but the Doppler effect in sound is, is, well, actually the Doppler effect in general is defined really, really simply as the apparent change in frequency. Note the word apparent. The apparent change in frequency um, uh, when the source of a wave or the observer <coughs> are moving with respect to one another. The only important thing is the relative motion of source and detector. So it doesn't matter which one is moving. It's the relative motion between the two that is important. Okay, and all that's happening, and the reason this is, is you know, that word apparent is so, so important. Uh, because our source, we're assuming, is at a constant frequency. All right, so it's emitting sound waves in all directions of the same wavelength, same frequency, same wave speed, all other things being equal, right? It's oblivious to the fact that there is an observer that might be moving or that it is moving. It's just emitting, emitting sound waves. Okay, the reason that the frequency may appear to change is that if... You know, let's, let's take our ears as being the detectors, right? So if we are moving towards the source of the sound, so here's the source of the sound, then actually we're crossing wave peaks faster per second. We're going through more wave peaks per second if we're moving towards the source of the sound. Right? They're coming out at a constant rate, but now we're crossing them. Right? And if we're moving away from the source of sound, we now get fewer wave crests per second passing us. Because we're now moving, you know, uh, they've got to travel further, in other words, uh, to catch up with us. Because we've moved in the intervening period. I'll show you some animations of this later, which, which might help. Okay, so let's take the image of us moving towards the source of the sound again. So more wave crests per second, so we hear, what the frequency we hear is actually higher. Right? It appears that we've got more cycles per second because we're moving towards the source. If we're moving away from the source, it appears that we've got fewer cycles per second. Right? So in one case we hear a higher frequency, in the other case we hear a lower frequency. But the source itself is just emitting the same frequency all the time. So it's the apparent. I Sorry to... No, no, go ahead. I, I can understand it being apparent if the observer's moving, but obviously the wave propagates through a medium, and yep. the medium isn't moving. True. So why is it only apparent if the source is moving? Because you literally have to have your ear in con or direct <laughs> contact with, say, the structure of the source to feel it as anything other than shifted. If sorry. Like only the internal vibrations <coughs> of the sound would be a, the same frequency whereas anything else, because the medium itself isn't moving, yeah. so why is it still only an apparent shift? Well, because, uh, because we, uh, we are perceiving a different frequency because we're going through maxima and minima and maxima in the pressure of the air mm. at a different rate. All right? Because you're quite right, it's coming out from the source of the sound into a medium, say air. All right? So take away everything else, uh, we're just getting, you know, spherical wave fronts coming out, you know, at whatever frequency from this source. Yeah? yeah? So stand yourself as a detector at a distance from that source, stationary. That's exactly what you're here. Right? You're here pressure maximum, pressure minimum, and so on. You'll pick that up as a particular frequency in your ear as they go past you. Mm -hmm. Right? Through the air. Right, the only difference now is that we introduce some relative motion. Right, so now you're moving towards the source of the sound, say. Mm -hmm. So these 
wave fronts are still coming out at the same speed, still 340 meters per second or whatever it might be, but you're now crossing them in the other direction at so yeah. many meters per second. Yeah? So, I, I don't know, what, what's a sensible speed uh, to be walking at? Um, two meters a second, say? Right? So you're moving at two meters a second uh, towards the source of the sound. They're coming out at 340 <coughs> meters per second. So it will appear to you as though suddenly the wave speed has changed, mm. right, to 342 meters per second. Because that's going to be the relative speed between you and the wave. I guess you'd hear the true frequency if you were perpendicular to the axis of motion. If you're... Um, Even stationary, right? So if they're going out the sides... Yeah, they're going, well, they're coming out spherically yeah. all around, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, it, that, it, it may come clear when I show you the cartoon that I've got later. It does work. I checked it before I came down this morning. Um, so, diagrammatically, this is what we've got. Right? <coughs> and again, the cartoon I'm going to show you will, will give you this in motion. So, here's our point source of sound at time one, whatever that might be. All right? And out from it comes a spherical wave, which in this 2D case, of course, has to be a circle. So, that now has expanded out to be that circle there. Right? Now, this is the case where the source is moving. So the next wave peak that comes out, <coughs> the source is in a slightly different position. It's moved a bit. But it's still putting out a spherical wave front. So there it is. Right. It's just that the center of the circle has now moved a bit because the source has moved. Yeah? And the same all the way along here to this most recent one the source has now moved up to this position labelled S7 on the diagram. Again, spherical wave coming out. And if we draw a circle around that point, we get that thing there. So these are all circles, but they're circles with a different point of origin because the source has been moving as this wave is being <coughs> emitted. So if we're listening on this side, for instance, what we're going to hear is something that looks like a bunched up set of wave crests. So it will, he it will sound like a higher frequency that is actually being emitted from the source. Yeah? If, on the other hand, we move our detector around this way, right, and we listen to what's coming out this way, it's going to sound like we've got a lower frequency. They're actually more spaced apart here. Right, now this is the line of motion of the source, remember. So actually if we go at right angles to that, which comes back to one of the points you made just now, actually we'll hear no difference in frequency at all. Because at right angles to it, you know, these are actually spaced equally. There's no bunching up or stretching out. Because right? the source is actually only moving in that line there. So it is only the relative motion between the source and the observer uh, that's going to count. So, in terms of equations, you don't need to remember these equations, by the way. Uh, I'm putting these in for completeness rather than there's anything you actually need to memorise. But this is essentially what we're doing. So this is, you know, if we go back to the analogy I tried to describe earlier, um, you know, speed of sound and speed of walking or running or whatever it was you're doing, this is the modification then to our classic <coughs> C equals F lambda equation that is describing the apparent frequency, right? The frequency of the source is static. The speed of the source is something we need to take into account in terms of either adding to or subtracting from the speed of the wave. Yeah? So in this case we'd be adding to the speed of the wave because the source is moving in that direction also. 
in this case we're subtracting it from and that will change the frequency that we hear ok <coughs> same thing applies if our source is static so here our you know our circular wave fronts are concentric as you would expect the source is no longer moving but our detector is moving instead alright so the wave fronts are coming out at a constant rate but our detector is moving in the opposite direction so it's crossing these wave fronts at a higher rate so it's, it's detecting more wave fronts per second than if the detector was static yeah so we get an apparently higher frequency here once our detector starts moving out the other way we'd actually get an apparently lower frequency all right now again maths you don't need to worry about this is just a very simplistic uh, description of what the Doppler shift is in other words it's the shift it's the difference I beg your pardon between the observed frequency so the apparent frequency in other words uh, and the actual frequency of the source all right and remember we've done nothing to the frequency of the source it has remained constant so if we just have a look at this one animation <coughs> which might help <coughs> okay so we're going to have a source of our sound over here and this uh, animation is set up such that the source is going to move right? so it's going to move in a line across the screen left to right but as it goes it's just going to emit circular wave fronts so at whatever point the source has got to it's emitting circular wave fronts all right so it'll just show you i suppose in some cartoon fashion what it's going to look like Right, you see vaguely what's happening there. The source frequency itself is totally unchanged, it's just emitting circular waves at a particular frequency. It's just that what we would hear if we were on the right hand side of the screen is going to appear to be a higher frequency than on the left hand side of the screen. Yeah. What would happen if the source speed was greater than the wave speed? Uh, then you get a supersonic bang. Um, it gets very complicated at that point, but that really is when you know when a plane, for instance, travels uh, at Mach one or higher, speed of sound or higher, then you get this shock wave at the front. And basically, the, the the speed of sound in air is a measure, crudely speaking, it's a measure of how fast <coughs> the air molecules can respond. So if you're trying to push something through it faster than the air molecules can actually respond then you get this this supersonic effect so it's it's outside the realms of, of the Doppler effect it's a much much more complicated effect but but that is what would happen you can actually get it with light as well believe it or not um, you get something called Cherenkov radiation uh, which is really quite pretty if you get to see it but you need to be near um, a fuel um, a, 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 an old fuel tank in a reactor to see it so it's not something you get to do every day I've only seen it once in my entire life but it was really pretty the entire lake of water was glowing bright blue with Cherenkov radiation fantastic sight um, but anyway that's a, that's a digression that's another story um, ok so let's get rid of this and get back to where we were um, okay, now before we go on to that, I was going to give you some uh, practical demonstration, and this is going to be painful on the ears and potentially for those of you in the front few few rows, um, lethal. So uh, <laughs> if you want to duck at this point, you can. Uh, but basic, all I've got is, is a little buzzer, printed circuit board buzzer, right, connected to a nine volt battery, which is why it's hazardous, right? 
uh, one of those little rectangular things you get in smoking land. Um, and I'm going to swing it around my head. <laughs> um, actually, it might not be you guys. It probably is more likely to be the ones in the middle. Um, no, don't worry. It's tied on really well. I was never a Boy Scout, but I think that notch is okay. Um, <laughs> now, if um, if this thing is yeah. travelling towards you, uh, right, you should hear a higher frequency if the Doppler effect is working. Uh, if it's travelling away from you, so uh, let's assume I'm going to swing it around like that, right? So as it's coming, what did I say I was going to do? Right, that way. As it's coming that way, you should hear higher frequency. As it's going that way, you should hear a little frequency because it's moving away from you. Right? At the point where it's either here or here, in other words, the relative motion between this and your ear <coughs> is zero because it's actually just doing that, it's not going towards you or away from you, you will hear the actual frequency of the source. Right? So, what you should hear as this spins around. <coughs> If I plot the frequency out, right, against time, you should hear when uh, it's coming towards you at an apparently higher frequency, right? When it's going across your path, either you know on this bit of the circle or the opposite, uh, you should hear the frequency of the source. When it's travelling away from you, you'll hear a lower frequency. All right, and it should just continue like that. All right, so what is this? This is the actual frequency of the source, right? So it's just varying the frequency of <coughs> here above and below um, the frequency of the source, okay? So that's what it sounds like on its own, all right? Right? So get the bits of the circle right, you should better hear the frequency going up, through its source value, down, back to its source value, and then up again. Right? And it obviously depends on the... Sorry, I don't want to get entangled with other things. Okay? Now, what do you think I'm hearing in the middle? Same thing. Yeah, actually, no change at all. This is not moving relative to my ears. Alright, it's you guys that are getting the change. That's the dangerous thing. You escaped. Okay, so that's the Doppler ship, uh, shift in, in, in practice. If anyone wants to play with this afterwards, then let me know. Um, There'll be a disclaimer you have to say. Um, so let's move on to sort of practical <coughs> applications of this. And one of them, and I did tell you a while back, I would talk about this, uh, is radar speed traps. Um, and those rely on the Doppler effect. All right, so it's emitting uh, a set of waves. The car, whatever it is, is either travelling towards or away from the source of that frequency. Yeah, and then there's a detector that picks up whatever gets reflected back again, bounce back. Right. So there is a relative motion between the source of the sound uh, and the detector, because the car, van, whatever it might be, is, is actually moving. Okay. So it's really, really simple in that respect. All you've got to do is measure the apparent change in frequency and you know if we go back to those equations I had there you've now worked out what the speed of the observer is you know, it's not Vs in this case it's Vo right speed of the observer you know the speed of the waves going out it's just the speed of light so all you've got to do now is measure the apparent frequency right and that immediately gives you the speed. Now there's a problem with this, um, and it's a problem that won't escape your minds at all, I'm sure. The frequency being used 
in a radar speed trap is about a gigahertz, so about 10 to the 9 hertz. <coughs> the change induced by the motion of a vehicle is in the region of kilohertz. So you're looking at one part in a million change. So if you're going to make this viable in terms of, of legal action, then that's actually a bit dodgy. Measuring a kilohertz out of a gigahertz is actually a really tough thing to do with precision. All right. So this is where the, the other principle that we've talked about already kicks in. So what it uses is beats. Okay, so it doesn't actually just measure the change in apparent frequency. It sends out one signal at a certain frequency. Another one gets bounced back, which is very slightly different. Remember, you know, what we said about setting up beats in the first place. They had to be very slightly different frequencies. And this is one part in 10 to the 6 different. So instead of measuring, trying to measure the Doppler effect straight off, what it does is use the fact that we have an outgoing uh, signal at a constant frequency. We have one coming back that is Doppler shifted, so it's now a slightly <laughs> different frequency, and you allow the two to superpose. So you measure beats. And actually measuring the beat frequency is really easy, because the beat frequency is just the difference between the two. So it's the difference between one gigahertz and one gigahertz plus a kilohertz. It's just a kilohertz. Right? Measuring kilohertz is child's play. So actually you need the Doppler effect and beats to make a re radar speed trap work. Uh, and that's <coughs> how it's done. Um, which is totally relevant to this course, but you know, an interesting piece of side information. Um, so in desperation, you can always pull that piece of information out in a conversation. Um, it depends how geeky you want to sound, I suppose. Really, um, in astronomy, this is this is a you know this is a Doppler effect that is is actually pretty well known, right? Uh, most people have come across the redshift, uh, even if they don't understand precisely what it's what it means. But this is essentially uh, a Doppler effect, an apparent change in the frequency now of light, not of sound, uh, because the source of the light, star, galaxy, whatever it might be, uh, has a motion relative to the observer, us, the astronomers. Okay, so if a distant galaxy is moving away from us, we will see light that appears to be shifted towards longer wavelengths, right? hence towards the red end of the visible spectrum, hence calling it redshift. Because when this was first discovered, it was only visible light that people were detecting. OK. Now, how do you tell? How do you tell that the spectrum from a, a distant galaxy is being redshifted or not? Right? It's just a color, right? How do you know that it's changed from when the light was actually being emitted from that galaxy. Anyone come across this in more detail and know what the answer is? Perhaps. So obviously it gets progressively worse the further away you are, that they would all conveniently line up. They must have noticed that the ones further away tended to be redder than the ones nearer. Um, actually, well, that's true, but that came after rather than before. Ah. Um, and actually, it was an incredibly important observation because it, it, it was that was the first time that anybody actually put an estimate on the size of the universe through exactly that calculation. Uh, it's the work that um, Edwin Hubble did, right? So, if you've heard of the Hubble constant, it's coming out of that calculation. Right. Remember, we talked about absorption lines. <coughs> Right? And I mentioned the fact that helium as an element was first discovered by looking at light coming from the sun. Right? So you have this continuous spectrum, as far as our eyes are concerned, but actually if you split it up, if you disperse it enough into its different wavelengths, we saw dark lines. 
And the dark lines were due to the fact that there are helium atoms in the atmosphere of the sun that were absorbing at very precise frequencies uh, the light coming out of the, uh, out of the sun. Right? In order to create excitations in, in the electrons in, in helium. Yeah? And these are really, really sharp lines. They occur at one energy. Just the excitation energy of whatever electron <coughs> excitation we're looking at. And that is a piece of information that astronomers assumed was universal. Right? So it's happening in the distant galaxy as well. And these really, really sharp markers, if you like, for hydrogen, for helium, for all sorts of other gases out there, uh, are still going to be present. Right? So you measure the position, the wavelength, the frequency of those lines, never mind about the broad spread of colours, and if they are shifted a little bit, then you have precisely a measure of the Doppler shift in the light coming off that object. All right, so you, you've made an assumption. You've made an assumption that um, uh, you know atomic physics is the same here as it is on you know the other side of the universe. Not an unreasonable assumption, I would suggest. Uh, but nevertheless, you've made that assumption. On the basis of that assumption you can measure with, with great precision uh, what the redshift is and therefore the relative um, velocity of whatever that object is compared to us. Only the relative, right? Not the absolute, the relative. So you can actually, you know, you can measure blue shifts as well. Right? Blue shifts are caused when objects are moving towards us as opposed to away from us. Right? It's still the Doppler effect, exactly the same thing. Right? It's a less common phenomenon to measure, as you might imagine. But for instance, for a, a cluster of stars or a galaxy that's rotating very fast, actually the, the side that's rotating towards us, as it were, you know, can be coming towards us faster than the galaxy as a whole is moving away from us, if you see what I mean. So you get a slight blue shift detected depending on whether you're looking at one side of the rotating galaxy or the other side. Yeah? So it's a fairly potent thing in, in astronomy as well. 